Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a critical conversation on race and polarization in America. I'm Yvette Alexander, Director of Learning and Impact at the Knight Foundation, and we want to welcome your participation in the dialogue today. If you have a question, feel free to post it in the Q&A box, and we will try to address them towards the end of the panel. The springboard for today's panel conversation are two recent studies on the state of polarization in America, one by More in Common and the other by the American Enterprise Institute's Survey Center on American Life. Both surveys show Americans have vastly different perceptions when it comes to race and discrimination in our country. And the conversation that these findings should spark, both in the webinar today and beyond it, is the main reason why we are here today. So after a brief presentation of the findings, we'll turn, our panel, we'll turn to our panel of leading thinkers on race and community and explore how to address these divisions across America. So let me introduce the two researchers with us today. First, we have Stephen Hawkins. He is Director of Research at More in Common. More in Common is an international organization with a mission to understand the forces driving us apart to find common ground and to help bring people together to tackle our shared challenges. Welcome, Stephen. We also have uh, Dan Cox, who joins us from the American Enterprise Institute, where he is the director of the Survey Center on American Life. AEI is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to understanding the way cultural, political, and technological changes are shaping the lives of ordinary Americans. Finally, I'd like to introduce our lead panelist, Ted Johnson. Welcome, Ted. He is Senior Fellow and Director of the Fellows Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. And in this role, he explores the intersection of race, politics, and public policy outcomes as they relate to the systems of democracy and justice. Ted is also a retired Navy commander, former White House fellow, and the author of the forthcoming book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America. Here he is to introduce the rest of our panel today. Welcome, Ted. Thank you so much for having me and for that introduction. Um, so I wanna quickly introduce the panelists who will react to the research that we're going to see in a few minutes. And so I'd ask as I say their names that they sort of show up on video. And then after I turn it back over to the researcher, we'll go quiet and let Dan do his thing. Um, you can look at the invite or the, the flyer brochure for the event to get the full bios of each of the panelists. They're, they're really accomplished folks. So I'm just going to introduce them by their name and position title and affiliation uh, for now so that we can get into the conversation. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Anthea Butler, who is the Chair of Religious Studies and Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And then we've got uh, Emily Eakins, who's a research fellow and director of polling at the Cato Institute. Uh, Ravi Perry, who is the chair and of uh, the political science department at Howard University, and of course a, a professor there as well. So welcome to Ravi, Emily, and Anthea. Um, what I'll do now is turn it over to Dan to walk through his presentation, at, followed by Stephen Hawkins, and then um, me and Emily, Anthea, and Ravi will rejoin you and kick off the conversation. Dan. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, um, it's great to be here to run through the, these recent findings. I wanna thank the Knight Foundation for its support of this work. When we conduct surveys as pollsters, uh, we often make a great big deal about the differences between Americans and how they vote and the issues they care about. Uh, based on their personal characteristics, who they are. And embedded in this thinking is how about how we act and what we think uh, are primarily functions of these ascribed and achieved attributes, our, our age, race, gender, religion, ed education level. But we know that so much of human behavior and knowledge are socially constrained, meaning that what we know and what we think and how we act are shaped by those around us. Uh, often in ways that we're not even aware of. And our goal with this project was really to understand more clearly the set of social constraints and incentives in our immediate social environment and what this means for our politics and our public life. So I know no one likes to hear about methodology, but I've got to talk about it real, real quick uh, before getting into the results. This was a survey of 4,000 adults conducted over the summer. It was self-administered by NORC at the University of Chicago. That's all really we need to know here. But I want to talk a little bit about how we measured social networks in the survey. 
you'll, you'll hear me use that phrase a lot, social networks, and it's important for, for me to define the term before we move any further. So when I talk about social networks, what I actually mean is core social networks. These are the people who are closest to us. The survey does not provide uh, a measure of the overall uh, complex web of social relationships that each one of us has. Rather, what we did is we used an approach that relies on respondents identifying the people closest to them, defined as in this survey, uh, you, person you've talked to within the last six months uh, about an person or important matter or concern. And this is regardless of the relationship you have with that person, where that person might live, or even how often you talk to them. Uh, so survey respondents could provide up to seven people and they would provide their first name and initials. And once they did, we asked them an extensive battery of questions uh, about their age, their gender, their race, their religion, uh, and political preference, just to name a, a few. And from this, we could construct a really clear picture of their immediate social environment. Uh, all right, a quick look at the results. Here, we're looking at the composition of our core social networks, and it's really hard to deny the fact that we are incredibly socially segregated al along lines of race and ethnicity. And uh, what we see here is the results uh, showing the percentage of networks that are white, black, Hispanic, Asian, multi-race, or some other race. And it's strongly correlated with our racial and ethnic background. So uh, here we see clear evidence of self-sorting based on race and ethnicity, and it's not constant between groups. So white Americans are the most socially segregated. 92% of white American networks are white. Uh, for black Americans, it's 77%. For Hispanics, it's 53. And for Asian Americans, it's 63. Uh, so again, we, we see strong evidence of social sorting, uh, but again, not evenly distributed across uh, the country and across these different groups. Another way to look at this is to look at uh, the percentage of Americans whose social networks include only members of their own racial or ethnic group. And again, there are considerable differences uh, between different racial groups, with whites being uh, having the most homogeneous networks and Hispanic Americans having the least. So here we see roughly three quarters of Americans and a majority of Black Americans uh, have social networks that are that include only members of their own race. And for Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans, uh, they're far less likely to ha have these types of, of uniform racial networks. It's also really notable that the degree of social sorting that we see uh, among the public does not vary all that much, regardless of differences in, in background and personal experience. So looking among whites, younger Americans are some, uh, more likely than older Americans to have diverse racial networks, um, but still 70% of young white adults have networks that include only uh, other whites compared to 85% of, of white seniors. There are only modest differences by education level, uh, the largest difference is actually that we see here is by region. So whites living in the Western United States are far more likely than whites in any other part of the country to have uh, diverse racial networks. Uh, lastly, for this section, uh, it's notable that the, the political context also differs significantly between people with different racial and ethnic backgrounds. So Black Americans are far more likely to be embedded in democratic social networks, that, that, meaning that they have only uh, Democrats in their networks. And this matters a lot because independent of political ideology or identity, uh, Americans that have uniform political networks are, have much greater partisan affinity. They behave more tribally uh, and they have more consistency in their voting than those who have a mix of democratic and Republican people in their network. Uh, and when we try to understand the strong commitment of black Americans to the democratic party, you know, we really shouldn't ignore the role that this unique political context plays. Looking at uh, social net network segregation and perspectives on discrimination, um, when it comes to perceptions of discrimination, Republicans and Democrats see the world quite differently. The overwhelming number of Democrats believe that racial and religious minorities, gay and lesbian people, and transgender people faced a lot of discrimination in the US while Republicans are far less likely to agree. Conversely, Republicans are significantly more likely than Democrats to say white people and Christians experience a lot of discrimination in the US. And it's notable that the perception gap between Democrats and Republicans is actually largest uh, in, in views over, over whether Black Americans face uh, a lot of discrimination. And this is really important. Uh, but what we found is that the difference between Democrats and Republicans is not simply the result of, of having more or less diversity in their immediate social network. When we look at both uh, white Democrats and white Republicans, their social networks when it comes to race are largely similar. Very few have members of, of um, uh, their networks who are black. Uh, 
And this suggests that greater racial diversity may not actually be a driver of changing attitudes or perceptions when it comes to race. And what we found is that for whites, actually having a Biden supporter in your network, at least one, uh, matters a whole heck of a lot more than having someone who's uh, uh, black or uh, person of color. And so white Americans with at least a Biden, one Biden supporter in their network are far more likely to, to believe that black Americans experience discrimination than those who do not, not have any. So I'll end right here and say that this, is, this goes much further than just uh, perceptions of discrimination when we talk about uh, racial diversity among our, our networks. Americans with more racially diverse networks are also more likely to believe that discrimination is a serious concern than those who do not. And there's a link between racial network diversity and uh, racial policies overall. So here we looked at uh, white Americans uh, and views of support, uh, affirmative action and white Americans with racially diverse networks are more supportive of affirmative action than those whose networks uh, include only people uh, who are also white. So that was a, a really, really short synopsis. I'd encourage you, if people are interested in this, check out this work at americansurveycenter.org. I'm super excited about our panel, but before we do, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen at More in Common. Thank you, Dan. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and do a whirlwind tour of our study. Okay, so thank you to Knight Foundation and to all of the fellow panelists for joining us today. What I'm going to speak to is our American Fabric findings, which are forthcoming. We'll publish this study next month. And this American Fabric project is designed to explore how our shared American identity can be broadened and can serve as a resource to help us come together and solve problems. This study is reporting on 4,000 nationally representative interviews which we conducted with YouGov. So I'm just gonna make three points today. There's a lot of slides and a lot of data, but all of them just service three major points. And the first is that belonging in America is an experience heavily shaped by race. And so for much of the presentation, we'll focus on the experience specifically of Black Americans. But we want to start here with looking at experiences of non-white Americans relative to white Americans. And we see that perceptions of belonging and discrimination really vary according to whether you're white in the way that people self-report their experience. So when we look at questions such as whether people feel more judged than others, whether they feel that they're considered American enough, we see that there is a commonality across Black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans reporting that they often feel that way, particularly in feeling American enough. We see 73% of Asian Americans report that. And then we see that on other questions related to belonging and experience, we see that there's more commonality, for instance, between white and Asian Americans in their experience of whether they have an easier path through life or whether they feel that they get better treatment from law enforcement. But specifically on this point of whether people feel more judged um, than others, we see that really whether you're white or non-white is a very definitive factor in how you feel on this question. And so what we have here is our categorization that More in Common uses that we introduced through our Hidden Tribe study, which is our political typology where we have progressive activists on the far left all the way to devoted conservatives on the far right. And you can see that really independently of where someone falls along that political typology spectrum, we do find that um, the experience of non-white Americans is one where people perceive that they are more judged. So the second point I wanna make here is that the disagreements about racism, its extent, its nature, um, are really deeper by ideology than by race. And this is a counterintuitive point. And so I'm going to make it in three different ways by looking at three very different types of data. So when we just ask the overall question of whether people think that racism is a significant problem in the country today, we find that 70% um, of Americans almost uh, across the board say that it is. And similarly, if we're asked, when we ask whether uh, Americans believe that we're close to achieving Dr. Martin Luther King's dream, we see that less than half think that we're close. And you see that there are some differences here. You can see that white Americans are um, less concerned than black Americans by a margin of 15 or 20% here, but it's not an enormous gap. 
And then by contrast, I want to show these exact same questions. So the extent of racism and its significance today and how close we are to achieving Dr. Martin Luther King's dream by our political typology. And here you can see that we don't see differences of opinion here of 15 or 20 percent, but more like of 70 percent, of 75 percent. And it's worth noting here that the progressive activist group is not overwhelmingly people of color. In fact, it's 80 percent white and our devoted conservatives group are 88 percent white. And so what we see here is very intense disagreements about racism among white political Americans and more commonality in perspective across uh, racial groups. Here's another way of looking at the same phenomena. So here we ask people to say how warmly or coldly they felt towards each of the large set of groups um, from racial groups to immigrants, lesbian, gay people, et cetera. And you can see here that when looking at these data across racial groups, you see that there are some differences, but they're not too striking. However, when you look at this by our devoted conservatives versus progressive activist group, these are our far left and far right groups within our political typology. You see those differences are far more pronounced, indicating a much deeper difference in perspective in terms of how they view groups within the country. And then this slide has quite a lot of data, but I'll do my best to summarize it quickly. We asked specifically about types of um, racism that Black Americans face today. So you can see across the bottom there, we have seven different ways that Black Americans might face discrimination from the criminal justice system to the way they have opportunities to have housing to the legacy of slavery. And here uh, we're reporting on how frequently people of different, uh, Americans of different races perceive these to be uh, things that face Black Americans. And again, you see that there is a gap um, particularly between Black Americans and Hispanic Americans of about 15 or 20 percent on each of these points, where Black Americans are more likely, typically around 70 percent, to say that this is a particular way of experiencing racism that Black Americans still face. Now I want to show the same questions again, but here we have our political spectrum. And you can see that the progressive activists overwhelmingly and in some cases almost universally seeing each of these types of racism as things that Black Americans are facing while our devoted and traditional conservatives in the teal and purple circles on the bottom there overwhelmingly reject or don't perceive those to be relevant. And so again, what we're seeing here is that the, the mismatch in perceptions of what's happening in the country racially, what's happening in the country with regards to racism really varies most starkly by political ideology and much less so according to which race people belong to. Finally, I just want to talk a bit about experiences of being American and how those vary. Um, our, this project, American Fabric, is very much interested in how connected we feel to each other across races, generations, political identities, and whether that um, superordinate identity of being American is one that can serve as this encompassing umbrella that can bring us together. And here we see when we ask questions about, for instance, whether we're proud to be American, whether we're grateful to be American, how important being American is to our identities, we see that most Americans have a pretty high um, degree of gratitude and, and place a high degree of importance on that identity, about three and four or four out of five Americans say that they're proud to be American, for instance. Um, but there's a pretty sharp divide by ideology with a minority of progressive activists, for instance, saying that they're proud to be American and 100%, 100% of devoted conservatives saying that they are proud to be American. And these divisions by generation are also quite stark. And so we see here the oldest, oldest generations here on the left-hand side, those who are the silent generation or before boomers, 90% um, plus saying that they're proud and grateful to be American and then the Generation Z and Millennials falling um, just around half in some cases saying that they're proud to be American and that is part, part, an important part of their identity. And interestingly, this is just not as divisive a question when you look across genders or when you look across races. And here you can see that whether it's white, black, Hispanic, or male or female, we're really seeing very comparable levels of attitudes in general towards how people feel towards their American identity.
And so in summary, we see a lot of challenges towards constructing a stronger, more inclusive, superordinate American identity where everyone feels that they belong. And those really vary between the experiences of belonging that face uh, or the lack of experience of belonging that faces a lot of non-white Americans, people of color, all the way to deep, deep divisions in the perceptions of the extent of the problems of racism that we're facing, which are more are better described by ideology. And then some meaningful differences along generational lines as well with regards to how attached we are to feeling part of America. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Ted Johnson. Very good. Um, when I, I'll tell you, I could talk forever about uh, some of the, the findings here, um, but we've got about 30 minutes to have a, a rich conversation about what's going on. So I'd like to invite back Emily, uh, Ravi, and, and uh, Anthea to, to talk through it. Uh, I, I want to give a couple of things that stood out to me. Again, uh, lots of insights here, but I'll start off and then I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists to react to some of the data we've just seen. The first thing to me is um, it does seem like we're having that elusive national conversation on race. The problem is we're talking about it with people who look just like us. And so white Americans are having a conversation about white race with other white Americans and black Americans are having a conversation with other black folks and Hispanic folks are having it in their circles. And then you know, usually in well-functioning, well-ordered societies, you bring those views to the public square. And as they bump up against one another, they shape some consensus or some common understanding of what the issues are and where people stand. And that's not happening, at least uh, my read of this data, it doesn't seem like that's happening in our social circles. Instead, what's happening is our views are becoming crystallized and hardened in our racial groups. And then by the time we show up into broader society, into the public square to talk about race, we are dug in on our positions that have now become racialized in, in, their, in their construction and in their shaping. And it's really hard to try to find any kind of common ground when you're in the public square to defend a position instead of there to learn or engage other folks who are like you. And uh, the other part of this is that lack of interaction. There's like a, a, a compassion element that disappears, I think, um, and a willingness to sort of understand your fellow Americans who may not look like you. So that's one. Um, the other part of this is, is um, I'm sort of, I want to say that racism has seems like it's become more partisan uh, based on some of the, the charts we saw, but racism, I think, has always been partisan to some extent, certainly after the Civil War, once Black folks ended the, the um, electorate in, in larger numbers. But the thing that stands out to me is that I, I, it seems like the, the, depending on what demographic you belong to, you have a different way of being patriotic, a, a different way of expressing your Americanism. And I think a lot of the misunderstandings are that um, when black folks, the, I mean, you saw in the charts there, we're pretty much across race, everyone's pretty proud to be an American, pretty grateful to be an American. The parties differ, but the race is not so much. But when you look at uh, lived experiences, black Americans say, um, I'm kind of focused on where we're falling short. You know, I know who we say we are. I know, I know how we've been behaving. There's a gap there and we need to do something to address this gap. And it seems more like uh, white Americans are more focused on look at the progress, uh, look at how far we've come from where we were. So let's focus on the good and not where we're falling short. And neither one of those are less patriotic than the other. It's the focus on, it's where they place the focus on America that uh, creates um, a gap there. And because we don't talk to one another in our social circles, that gap begins to feel like one person doesn't live in the same America that we do, or rather doesn't see America the same as we do or loves America less, which can contribute to a bunch of deeper problems. Um, I, I, so what I wanna do now is turn it over. I, I, I feel like rambling for another 10 minutes on this, but um, let me give it to uh, Anthea to, to get her reaction to some of the slides there. Um, the slides are great. I think these are very interesting um, surveys. My question is twofold. Well, I have a comment first. My first comment is, is that the old adage of white people saying, I only have one black friend is probably true, right? 
I, I hate to say it, but it really does. I, I kept thinking about that all when I saw this whole, the, both of these surveys. So that's one. But the second one is, is I'm wondering, and maybe this is a question to both of our pollsters here, how much does this, has this been affected by the racial polarization that has happened over the summer? I heard that one of these was taken over the summer. And so I'm wondering what that might look like. But overall, I would say this, because a couple of things. One is, is that I think for Black Americans, it is the sense in which Black Americans have to always sort of reach out to other communities, or we have to understand other communities in order to be accepted and in the, in the job situation or whatever there is. You know, so we have anecdotal stories about that, and I'm not sure how the polls account for that. So that would be the first thing. The second thing I would say is that I find it very interesting about the disparity um, in between Black Americans and Hispanic Americans in terms of thinking about how um, things are, you know, Jim Crow or anything else affected Black Americans' lives. And I really want to dig into that one because I think that points to a lot of what we see, particularly on the West Coast, particularly in um, Southwestern states like Texas and others, where these polarization issues between African Americans and Hispanics or Latinos are really very deep. And I think this, this tracks into voting as well. So that's what I would say about this to begin with. Thank you. Excellent, very good. So let me go to Emily and then Ravi, and then I'll uh, give Stephen a chance to respond to uh, the question about the, the timing of the polling and how that may explain some of the, the, the findings there. Sure. Um, it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon. Um, thank you to uh, Stephen and to Dan. Um, this is fascinating survey data. And to Ted and Anthea, I completely agree with your comments. Um, it, it's hard, I feel like, to add more substantive to what you've said. Um, I think the chart that really stood out to me um, was one of the more in common charts that um, showed the percentage of people who feel that people like me are not seen as being American enough, or I feel that people like me get judged more than others. And there were some significant racial differences there um, in those perceptions. And I think that um, this really speaks to um, Dan's presentations about um, social networks and polarization, because I think that there is a, a, a very severe kind of lack of knowledge and awareness of the experiences of people outside our social networks. And it really shows the importance, the vital importance of having more diverse social networks so that we truly understand and hear from people within, the, within those trusted social networks about their own personal experiences. I mean, data is very important, but we can't underestimate the power of personal experience from people that we love and that we trust. Um, I've, I, I've worked in some polling areas that I've tried to focus on trying to highlight these different experiences because you know polling isn't about telling stories as much as it should be sometimes. Um, but some of the polling that I've done on criminal justice reform and policing reform um, asked people about their personal experiences with the police. Um, this is just one example. And we found um, that, uh, that black Americans were significantly more likely to say that the police had used a, a cuss word or a swear word in their interactions with them. And the reason I really wanted to hone in on that is that that is something that you can't really disagree about, uh, you know, tone or kind of dismiss. I mean, it's either, it's kind of the person said the cuss word or they didn't say the cuss word and you can't really dismiss that. And um, that kind of data analysis is something that, I've, um, that I find really interesting, but ultimately it's the power of those social networks to really be able to, for each of us to hear those stories. Um, and an example that I, that I think of myself since that we're talking about the power of stories um, is that my mom's former boss um, is also a member, we're all, we're members of the same church, um, you know, so we're kind of family friends and he's African-American. And when he um, moved to a suburb, a wealthy suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, um, he had some really interesting experiences that he shared with us and that he also over the summer shared with on Facebook, given everything that was going on. He shared stories about, so the neighborhood that he lives in that he described, he says, he says it's about 1% African-American. And he says he's going jogging in the morning on a Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, beautiful sky, taking pictures of the beautiful sky. And as he's jogging, he sees some of his neighbors kind of looking over their shoulder at him kind of confused. They don't know him. It's a big enough neighborhood that they don't know him personally and they want to know who he is. And then all of a sudden, maybe about 15 minutes later, a police car starts following him as he's jogging in the neighborhood. That story 
is a very powerful story because you feel the emotion that he feels. You feel the fear that went through his mind as he's, as he's jogging. It's not the same as being him, but it's more powerful, I think, when people have friendships where they can hear these stories. Um, and unfortunately, because of the segregation in the United States and these social networks, there aren't enough, people aren't able to hear these stories within their personal networks enough. And so I really appreciate how Dan and Stephen have highlighted this um, because I think it really gives us a lot to talk about and to think about um, kind of the power of using our social networks to get a greater understanding of the truth and to show more empathy and have more empathy for one another as Americans. Absolutely, well done, um, Ravi. I really appreciate everyone for your comments and I certainly echo uh, what everyone has said uh, relative to the uh, series of uh, surveys and I can't wait till they come out. I think this is great. Uh, to add to what was uh, uh, just referenced by Emily, I, as someone who has been both uh, a trainer of police in terms of diversity and inclusion efforts across the country, various departments, and who has been racially profiled by police, uh, I certainly would, would argue as another anecdotal example that those personal testimonies that I've given does seem to have a lot of headway for people that I've been engaged with uh, as it relates to these discussions in ways that uh, unfortunately perhaps data may not always uh, be effective in that regard. Uh, I, I will add uh, a few other points to both of these presentations which are just stellar and I can't wait to dive into them some more. Uh, a few things that stuck out to me. One is that Democrats and Republicans and their differences as it relates to uh, uh, racial attitudes, you know, isn't really seemingly defined by the, so the kind of the density of the diversity uh, around them. And that that is, uh, I think, an interesting uh, finding for me as an urbanist who studies uh, cities primarily uh, um, and how race operates in those locations. Uh, and what we and what what we can see is that if people uh, in the residential patterns um, associate their racial beliefs with uh, how they live, that as the data suggests, right, that may or may not be the reason why they have the polarizing views that they do. Another point that I found very interesting uh, if I, uh, from the survey, uh, the first one reference was the point here that for whites, one Biden supporter, right, mattered more than blacks in your own social network, which is very interesting. That seems to somewhat confirm uh, some work of uh, conservative political scientists from the mid 90s that argued that in some instances, as it relates to achieving racial policy outcomes for minority communities, that the party uh, ID of the elected official matters perhaps more than their race. And of course, in this case, the context is different, but the concept is the same. And that certainly may suggest that the um, attitudes that that folks have as it relates to race in America uh, and them discussing it within their social networks um, is in fact perhaps more uh, accepted uh, if there is not a black person among their networks, which is interesting. Um, in other words, if you're a white person and you have a Biden supporter, uh, you're more likely to perhaps believe uh, that race is a salient problem in America than if you were to have a black person who's in your network who's telling you that it is based on their own experience. And so, that, so that's an interesting uh, uh, finding I found as well. And then uh, another finding that I found interesting from the survey on belonging. I was just curious for the posters uh, on how we define belonging there. Um, the, is the belo belonging more of a synonym for inclusion? Is belonging more of a synonym for perhaps incorporation? Or is it just kind of like feeling comfortable? Uh, and I'd be really interested to see uh, what uh, the kind of inside of your data suggests in terms of what you think respondents thought they were responding to uh, as it relates to this concept of belonging. And then finally, uh, I, was, I will add that this notion of sorting, which is interesting, we, we seem to want to call it self-sorting when it's people of color who are uh, choosing to live in racially homogenous locations. When it's whites, we call it segregation. Uh, and, and I think, I think the, the nomenclature matters there uh, and that regardless of your racial group, it seems as though majority do still seem to self-segregate as it relates to their uh, social networks and perhaps their residential locations as well. And one point that I found, and I'll end with this, 
uh, very interesting was um, in the um, graph about seven ways that uh, African Americans face racism. Um, what I found most striking there was the closeness uh, between blacks and Hispanics and whites, et cetera, uh, along the lines of sorting as it related to one of those seven data points on uh, living in neighborhoods with fewer resources. Meaning that if you were black, uh, uh, you had a closer relationship uh, with whites, Hispanics, Asians, and others on that item of the seven than on any other, which seems to suggest uh, going back to the first survey's point about um, how even 70% of young people also, also today still self-sort as it relates to their social networks. Um, it seems as though um, those of who may be living in neighborhoods and own homes are also self-sorting and that uh, racial groups, despite their differences, um, seem to agree most closely on that measure of the seven uh, ways in which Blacks face racism. So I found that to be very interesting because it seems to suggest that self-sorting occurs both uh, among social networks and among residential location across all groups of color. Yeah, um, so there's a few questions coming in uh, and I want to use one of them to sort of kick into the, the, this next round of discussion. Uh, and it's the question asks, is it necessary to think of American identity as superordinate? Um, and the point here in, in the question is that the, the term American has been racialized and sort of, you know, the, it's, it's perceived to be someone who's white and Christian and sort of um, that's what the, the, the prototypical American is. And so as the nation has become more inclusive of other people over the course of its history, have the newer groups that have been welcomed into the, you know, more to accessing more of the rights and privileges of citizenship rejected the American label because of all of the history that has been done under that label. Um, and the sort of the exclusive nature of the term, how has that caused people maybe to reject notions of patriotism, which sort of bleeds into another question that's popped up, you know, have conservatives taken ownership of patriotism and the symbols of the American flag in a way that uh, progressives or uh, racial minorities may reject those, not because they don't believe in those principles, but because those symbols um, communicate an allegiance to a particular political ideology or party. And it's a rejection of the party of that ideology communicated through the symbols as opposed to a rejection of those symbols or, um, or the principles for which they stand. So I'm curious your thoughts on, on how the term American and the term patriotic have been racialized and then what that means for a nation that needs to come together and our only common, uh, thing I think are our shared values or are the, is the American idea. Ted, if you don't mind, I want to take this one because I think it points back to one of the charts that happened. I want to cross hatch this. When we talk about American or Americanism or, you know, these kinds of terms, they get not just nationalized, but they also get Christianized in a certain way. So the chart that showed the ideology between how conservatives felt at the end about evangelical Christians and how um, progressives felt about evangelical Christians, which was really low, like about 16, I think sort of tells us a tale about that. Because essentially what it means is that this construction of what it means to be American is usually white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, right? And everybody else who's not that ends up being on the outside of that. And so I think the kinds of things that we see with these terms Americanism, if you even think about how conservatives construct that, it's basically that you, you, know, you have a flag, you believe in, you're Christian, you are, um, there's a certain kind of way in which people posit this that's sort of, as I like to call it, back to the 1950s and to a mythical time that we, that never really existed actually. So these kinds of ideas about what America is are really structured in whiteness. And if we're gonna talk about this, we cannot help but to say that if you don't feel American, it's because you don't feel a certain kind of whiteness that is proposed, that is supposed to be part of what being American is. So that if you are a person of ethnicity, you're being asked to take on a certain kind of identity with Americanism. That means that you leave behind who you are and take on this kind of whiteness that ends up being what Americanism is constructed by this homogeneous group. 
Yeah, and I wonder if if can this can it be reclaimed though? I mean, if there's nothing uh, that should be racialized about terms like equality or liberty or freedom, and I wonder if there's a kind of Americanism that we can all subscribe to, attach to those principles, and leave behind or at least work to shed the the race and religious components of, of it. I think I we. Think so. I would add that. I mean, as the former president of the Association for Ethnic Studies. I mean, if, if we are requiring, right, that all people who are in public education throughout the country, for example, have to learn these histories of everybody who is who has become American here, uh, that is something that I think we will be able to actually accomplish. The fact that we have, you know, and I love how Anthea just took us to church here, you know, the fact that we have this current problem that is persistent where people don't feel American, uh, even though they are American, where, where the whole nomenclature being black versus black American versus African American versus a black immigrant, just as one example, that all that is also about how people feel or do not feel nationalized as part of this American experiment. But what makes America unique, right, is that unlike, uh, as we talk about in, um, um, in our uh, liberalism uh, theories, and I, as a political scientist, I also teach American political thought. And, and one of the things that we discuss in that class is literally what does it mean to be an American? And we have to separate people's nationalist identity uh, with the kind of formation of that which is this democratic experiment that makes America the unique country that it is and that our identities are not based on, uh, at least not supposed to be, uh, right, based on our race or our religion or our family heritage or our class. That's literally why this country was founded. And so uh, as, you know, people fleeing from religious persecution and other kinds of of um, isms and phobias. And yet what we find here is that that is a central contention in this country from the beginning. The boys talked about, it, of course, 1903 problem of, is the problem of the color line and citizenship is the core issue. We just had someone confirmed to the Supreme Court, right? Who has documented going on record indicating that she finds con has concerns about the validity of the 14th Amendment, right? Which gave African-American citizenship, which gave them for the first time a sense of being American. And if that is something that is now yet again being questioned, then uh, I, I fear that we're gonna continue to have to have this conversation for years to come. Emily, Emily any thoughts on the, um sort of the, the American being racialized, that term, and, and sort of how we recapture the broader, more inclusive version of America from it, the history of how that term has been used to exclude. Sorry, I'm muting myself. Um, well, like all the panelists, I agree that it's extremely pernicious for some, like a symbol like the American flag or the idea of being American or patriotic to become racialized or about a particular religion because that's an antithetical to the American idea. Um, and I would argue antithetical to the reason why America has been successful. Um, and so I think that I, I think that we're part of a project going forward about how to um, think about what it means to be an American um, by focusing on those things that we all have in common um, and really focusing on ensuring that when we talk about what it means to be an American, what it means to be a patriotic American, um, that that idea is one that is big enough for everyone um, to fit in. Um, and, the, and, the, and the fact that it hasn't been like that for so long um, is extremely troubling and unfortunately something that not every, like many people are unaware of. Um, and honestly, I think this summer has been kind of a wake up call for many people um, to realize that many people did not feel like it was inclusive of them. Um, and so I think that we're part of that project going forward right now um, and building that up together. Um, so, I mean, just like that, we're at 1245. We only have like five more minutes um, before we need to, to start wrapping up. Uh, and so I think that the last question um, I'll, I'll leave, I'll ask of, of the three of you is, so what now? We are, it's, it's hard to see through the present moment because everything, we're in the middle of a really contentious election. Uh, partisanship and political polarization seem to be um, at, at, at maybe not all time highs, but certainly um, at, in, a, in a bad place now. And so no matter what the outcome of the election is, 
is there a path in 2021 that doesn't have us careening further apart from one another, further segregated by, um, by race and in our social circles? Um, is it just a matter of good leadership or are there policy things that can, can force us to re-engage one another in constructive ways so that we have a more responsive democracy and feel more united as a people? And I'll add this one last bit, um, and, and uh, all of these things happening that does not require a catastrophe, that we, where we don't need to be attacked in Pearl Harbor or on 9-11 to feel united or feel you, you know, together or the pride again. Is there a way to manufacture that um, you know, in the wake of coronavirus, in the wake of George Floyd? Or, and you know, can, we, can we make it happen ourselves uh, go, going forward? And it's kind of a big question, so I'll let you sort of poke and prod at what feels right to you, but what, what now if, if folks are wondering uh, what can be done to, to close the divide? Or, or, or is there nothing? Is this just something we have to endure and, and hope that we come out the other end stronger? You know, I hate to be the voice of doom, but uh, we already are in a catastrophe and it's called coronavirus. And so I think that, you know, the kinds of divisions that, have, that these charts in these polls have shown us, this, these studies, are, are excavated by the fact that look at where we are right now. We're not in front of each other, we're on screens. And so I think there has to be a very concerted effort, at whatever happens in this election cycle, that we figure out ways to get closer to each other. And maybe it is the catastrophe of coronavirus that will bring us together. We've already had over what, 230,000 deaths in America. This will change how we have to think about things. And the fact that we have not grieved, the fact that we have not you know, dealt with this as a nation and bringing people together, the fact that people of color are the ones who are dying at a faster rate more than white Americans. These are issues that are gonna to continue to have us as ethnic communities push back against these kinds of divisions because we need the help. And I think that the ways in which we see this happen is, uh, is frankly with governmental change because it can't be, it's individuals can do different things to reach out. I could become friends with Emily tomorrow if I called her up and said, hey, only girl, let's talk, right? You know, I, I have white friends. I don't have to worry about this. But I think it's, a, it's a more of a, of a deeper issue that we need to deal with as a nation. And the reason why, and I'll close with this, the reason why African-Americans are always pushing this nation is because we know that we, it has to be better. We are always calling for these things, whether that's Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all kinds of other leaders. They have always called for America to be true to the message of democracy that has not been lived up to. Yeah, uh, Emily Ravi. Yeah, so I will add um, that there are a few things we can do. One, we mm -hmm. have to make sure that we do not limit whatever our activisms are to the news cycle. Uh, those of us who are people of color, who are marginalized, who have been othered, who have been left out in this country for decades, ever since 1789 or earlier, uh, we have to remember that we have to fight whatever those activisms are year round. Uh, as a political scientist, I have to say it frustrates me when you, know, you see such a bevy of activity and excitement and interest, of, usually around three months in and around a general election. And then, of course, you know, it's just a struggle to find that same energy and that same excitement, like you're talking about, Ted, in terms of catastrophe. What we call in political science is a crystallizing event, right? That there is something that motivates us in order to get us to action. But if we have to wait for that, then all the people whose lives have died in coronavirus in the meantime, all the people who have been uh, uh, disenfranchised and been victims of voter suppression in the meantime, all the people that have had uh, you know, a, a loss as a result of having limited uh, uh, health access, um, those are, kind, are the folks that we have to remember in between those events that do not get the news, that do not make crystallizing stories. Uh, because while we may know uh, you know, Trayvon Martin, and we may know um, 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 Nikon, uh, Nettles, we may know uh, so many others, Sandra Bland, we may know uh, Rakia Boyd, those are the ones that got on TV, right? And there are thousands of others who uh, are, live in our communities every day that we have to lift them up uh, who don't make the news. And so 
Worst thing we can do, do not limit our activism to the news cycle. Secondly, don't be victims of misinformation. Misinformation is a thing. Uh, it's happening. It's been targeting African-Americans in particular. We have a bipartisan Senate intelligence report uh, during the Trump era that has documented this. So we know this is a thing. And so that means we have to be diligent and, uh, and, and, not, and pay attention to that which we share, that which comes across our news feeds, uh, both digitally and in reality. Uh, and as it relates to our social networks, make sure that our social networks, as we learned from the survey data today, are not just phenotypically diverse, but genuinely have the, the kinds of diversities that, that create the kinds of dialogue that really moves us forward. And finally, I will say, uh, I do think we can look forward to the future. Four years ago, folks who uh, did not vote uh, in that election uh, have now been surpassed by over 500% just by early votes alone. And we still have five, six days left until the actual election day. That suggests that we do learn from past behavior. We do understand that crystallizing events are effective and that we do galvanize as a result. And so the hope is that, uh, that uh, we will be able to continue to do this as a population. Uh, and that is uh, being responsive to things that come across our, our, our news feeds, our interests, our issues, and then go out and change when we have the chance to do it. And this time that change happens to be on Tuesday. <laughs> Emily, final word before we go back to Yvette. <laughs> um, well, I don't have a whole lot to add other than um, I spend more time, I spend a lot of time thinking about cultural trends. Um, I think there's there's definitely stuff that can be done in the political realm, but thinking in the cultural realm, I really think that um, that part we need to be part of fomenting kind of a cultural shift, a cultural shift that's focused on empathy, diligence, and sincerity, um, and that with that, it's about changing hearts and minds, not just trying to say the right thing or you know trying to look good, but truly really trying to change our hearts. Um, and I think that really only uh, comes through a cultural change. Um, and I think that we do that by each of us kind of taking our kind of taking it upon ourselves to, to really try to expand our social networks, try to understand the perspectives and experience, experiences of others, suspending our judgment at first to just truly understand sincerely um, how other people um, what they're experiencing and what they're feeling to truly try to understand each other. And I think that's the only way to heal these divisions and polarization. That's not the only thing, but I think that that is a key ingredient um, as we move forward. Excellent. Thank you all. I'll give it to you, Yvette, um, to sort of take us home here. Sure, hello again. Wow, that was a really amazing discussion and exploration on what it really means to be an American and who feels like they belong to the democratic experiment that is the United States and how we might be more true in our hearts and in our networks to the message of democracy when it comes to race and our communities. Um, just in closing and on behalf of Knight Foundation, I wanna thank both the panelists and the researchers for your contributions, not only to this conversation today, but for the work you do every day to address these issues in our country. Um, and thank you to all the attendees for tuning in. We hope this research and the dialogue today has been helpful as we continue to wrestle with issues of race and polarization in our work and in our communities. For more insights from Knight Funded Research, please visit kf.org and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>